everyone, and welcome. Get ready, because today we're going to dive deep, deep into the world of Lego. Lego. You know it. But hold on, we're not talking about those sets you build at home, although those are awesome too. Right, right. We're talking about incredible, mind-blowing, large-scale Lego sculptures, and guess what? What? We're focusing on the amazing ones right here in Philly. And the cool thing is, you, our awesome listeners, you sent us some seriously inspiring stuff. Love it when they do that. I know, right? Yes. Pictures, stories, even, wait a second, is that a photo of the Liberty Bell made entirely out of Lego? See, this is what I love about Lego. It can go from, you know, a kid's toy to this amazing, like, mind-blowing art. It's true. You hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. And speaking of mind-blowing, think about those public Lego sculptures we see around Philly. Oh. It's like they just stop you in your tracks, right? They do. You're just walking along, and then boom, there it is. Exactly. It's that feeling of, whoa, how do they do that? And, you know, our listener, the learner, you mentioned that feeling. And I got to say, this deep dive is right up your alley. We're going beyond just building with Lego. We're talking about building on a massive scale. Oh, absolutely. And the scale, it just adds this whole other level of wow, you know? For sure. So thinking about that, how did they do that feeling? What's the first thing that pops into your head when we talk about the engineering behind these sculptures? Well, you know, the Liberty Bell is the perfect example, right? Very iconic. Iconic. Everyone knows that shape. But can you imagine trying to recreate those curves, that shape, with just rectangular bricks, thousands of them, all perfectly balanced? It boggles the mind. There's some serious, I mean, serious engineering happening there. And I was reading one of the articles, you know, the words you sent. It turns out that these sculptures, they don't just start with a pile of bricks. No way. Oh, yeah. They use 3D modeling software. Like, they plan every single brick placement on the computer first. Whoa, so it's like digital sculpting before they even touch a real brick. Exactly. It's wild, right? It's like this hidden layer of technology that most people don't even realize is there. That's so cool. It just goes mm -hmm. to show Lego is playful, but these artists, they're using it to push boundaries. Mm -hmm. And speaking of pushing boundaries, you mentioned Nathan Sawaya's Art of the Brick exhibit. Oh, yeah. That was huge -E here in Philly, right? Huge. And, you know, it really resonated with art lovers, and I know you, you would have loved it. So why his work, it goes way beyond just impressive builds, you know? He's capturing emotions, ideas, like using Lego as his paint. Right, I remember those pictures. So powerful. I remember that sculpture, the figure breaking free from a brick wall. Man, powerful stuff. So powerful. And you know what gets me is that we're talking about Lego, this playful medium, right? Mm. But it's sending a really profound message. It's incredible. And hey, Lego isn't just for world-renowned artists, right? There's this whole educational aspect that I know you're fascinated by. Oh, absolutely. And you know what came to mind? Those Lego workshops at the Franklin Institute that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. I've always wanted to check those out. They're great. And you know, it turns out that even building a simple Lego car, you know, with the wheels and everything, teaches kids about axles, gears, friction. Really? Oh, yeah. It's like sneaking in STEM education without them even realizing it. Genius. It's true. It's <laughs> like you're never too old to learn through play, and that's pure gold. Hmm. Oh, and speaking of play, you were saying something about Lego sculptures at the zoo. Now that's next level awesome. The zoo. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Can you imagine, like, being a kid and seeing a life-size gorilla, but get this, made entirely of Lego bricks right there next to the real gorillas? No way. Just sparks curiosity, right? Suddenly you're not just looking at a gorilla, you're thinking, how many bricks did that take? How did they get the fur to look so real? That's amazing. It's like tricking them into learning and they don't even realize it. <sighs> it's incredible how Lego can bridge that gap between art and science, play and learning. It's magic, I tell you. It really is. And, you know, as we start to wrap up our deep drive today, it leaves me with this question. What do these Lego sculptures say about us, about our world? Mm. Is it the creativity they inspire? Is it a reminder to never stop playing, to always explore? Or maybe it's the fusion of art and engineering that they represent. Mm. Good question. It's something to think about, right? Like, yeah. the next time you see a pile of colorful Lego bricks, don't just see toys. See potential, see creativity, see the amazing things we can create when we put our minds together, mm -hmm. just like those incredible Lego sculptures right here in Philly. I like that. And on that note, because this time we're marching right into the heart of winter at Valley Forge. Oh, yeah. But trust me. Okay. This deep dive mm -hmm. is about way more than just cold toes and frostbite. Way more. We're digging into how this place, right, which most people don't know, yeah. mm -hmm. 
saw no major battle. It's true. Became this unlikely turning point in the whole revolution. It is interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we we tend to picture Valley Forge and it's just this like picture of misery. Yeah, total misery. You know, and while obviously the conditions were absolutely brutal. Oh, yeah. It, it's really the resilience, I think, and the transformation that happened there that makes it important. Totally. I mean, that's what makes it so fascinating to me. Yeah. So for our listener who's ready to go beyond the textbook version of all this. OK. Let's set the stage. That's right. Of 1777 going into 78. Yep. What is the situation for the Continental Army? Uh, well, things are not looking great for the Continental Army. Okay. At this point, they've faced some really tough losses. Right. And on top of that, to just kind of twist the knife, Pitch. the British have captured Philadelphia. I mean, Philadelphia. Yeah. That's a huge blow. That was the capital. Big, big deal. Yeah, at the time. Yeah. So where do you even go when you need to regroup and strategize, but you've got to stay close to all the action? Right. That's where Valley Forge comes in. Okay. And this, I think, shows just how smart Washington was as a strategist. Yeah. He picked Valley Forge for a few really specific reasons. Like what? Well, it was only about 20 miles from Philadelphia. Okay. So it was close enough that they could kind of keep an eye on what the British were doing. Okay. So monitor the enemy, but far enough away to not get surprised. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Well, I, I'm going to guess, though, that those strategic advantages didn't really fully account for what those troops were about to face. No, they did not. Those natural defenses that Valley Forge had, right. they couldn't protect them from winter. Yeah. And, you know, that's where this story gets really interesting because the sources make it clear this isn't a place for big battles. Yeah. It was a completely different struggle. Yeah. You know, and, and thinking about it, our listeners sent in some pretty harrowing accounts. Really? Yeah. Like, seriously, a reality check. Wow. And it really makes you think about it, you know? Mm -hmm. How does this place become a symbol of American strength right. and resilience? That's the thing, Valley Forge. It really is, I think, a testament to just human endurance, you know? Like, it shows how even when things are unimaginably hard, yeah, they didn't just survive there. They transformed. Okay, so walk me through this transformation. Okay. Because I think this is where things are really going to get interesting for our listener. Yeah. So paint a picture of what life was like at Valley Forge. Okay. And no sugarcoating. All right. So imagine you're a soldier, right? Okay. Bone-chilling wind whipping through the trees. Yes. And you're lucky if you even have one pair of shoes. Oh, gosh. Let alone a proper coat. Yeah. The sources talk about constant hunger disease just ripping through the camp like wildfire. Mm. And shelters that barely kept out the snow. And definitely not warm. No. Nah. It's bleak. It was. And it really, I think, for our listener, brings home just how bad it was mm -hmm. for these soldiers. And it's so easy to get caught up in that, I don't know, romanticized idea of history. Right. But... We forget the human cost. Absolutely. You mentioned disease. Yeah. Just how bad was it? It's almost hard to put into words. Okay. Almost 2,000 soldiers died at Valley Forge. Wow. And not what in battle. That? Right. Disease was the real enemy. Wow. Typhoid, oh, pneumonia, yeah. dysentery. Yeah. It was just a constant battle to stay alive. 2,000 lives. That's more than a lot of Revolutionary War battles. It's true. And it really shows you that sometimes the quietest enemy yeah. is the deadliest. It's true. And it wasn't just the soldiers facing all this. Was it? No. We got to talk about the camp followers. Right. It wasn't just this encampment of soldiers. Uh, it was a whole community enduring these awful conditions together. Yeah. Wives, children, oh. mothers, sisters, cooks, laundresses, all these women, they provided these essential services. Yeah. Caring for the sick. Yeah. Keeping the troops fed and clothed as best they could, right. all while facing the same dangers as the soldiers themselves. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So you've got a desperate situation. I mean, morale has got to be just in the pits. Yeah. And I'm trying to imagine the conversations that must have been happening I know. around those meager fires. Yeah. How does Washington, yeah. the general, the leader, how does he navigate this and prevent total collapse? This is really, I think, where Washington's leadership just shines through. Okay. He got that this wasn't about military strategy anymore. Yeah. This was about holding on to hope. Wow. About keeping this idea of a nation alive in his men. I mean, that's powerful. Yeah. So more than just giving those rousing speeches. Oh, for sure. I mean, sure there were some of those. Oh, yeah. Washington knew how important words were. Right. But he also led by example. Okay. He shared the hardships with his men. Really? 
He absolutely refused to abandon his post, even when conditions were at their worst. Wow. I mean, just imagine 